Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to hopefully discuss two things. One, we're going to discuss the details of the supinator muscle. This is a muscle that's located in the anterior lateral forearm, and it's involved in supinating the hand. And the second thing we should talk about is the difference between pronation and supination. We really need to understand what they are and what's going on between the radius and the ulna. And so I'm actually going to begin by talking about the second question. What is pronation? What is supination? Okay. Um, when you're in anatomical position, hopefully we all know what that is by now. So we've got our, we're standing up straight, have our arms by our side, and our palms facing forward or ventrally. Okay. Um, in anatomical position, it turns out that your hands are supinated. And so what you can do is, if you're standing, you can go ahead and bend your elbows to 90 degrees and put your hands in front of you, or at least one of your hands. And your palm should be facing up with your elbow bent at 90 degrees. And so in this position, your, your hand is what we say supinated. The, the way I remember supinated is from a book that we had to read in high school called Oliver Twist. And in the book, he says, please, sir, I want some more. He wants some more soup. In order to hold a cup of soup, your palms have to be face up. You can't really hold the soup if your hands or palm are facing down. So in order to get that soup, you have to have your palms facing up. So supinated. Okay? Now, when your hand is supinated like this, this is how the bones in your forearm should look. So here's the radius. Okay? And then this bone right here that's on the medial side, this is the ulna. Remember that the ulna posteriorly has that olecranon process, which actually hooks into the olecranon fossa on the posterior side of the humerus, which is up here. But what I want you to notice is that when your hand is supinated, notice that the radius lies parallel to the ulna. So hopefully that makes sense. Now what I'm going to have you do is put your hand in the same position, so you have your arm or elbow bent to 90 degrees, palm facing up, and then all you're going to do is rotate your hand so your palm's facing down. Okay? What you just did was pronation. Okay? You've just pronated your hand. And when you did that, there's a couple things you want to notice. One, your ulna really doesn't change positions. In pronation and supination, your ulna really doesn't change positions. It's a static bone. And the reason for that has to do with what I mentioned just a minute ago. Remember that the olecranon process, which is that hook on the uh, proximal part of the ulna, it hooks back and locks into that olecranon fossa on the distal part of the humerus posteriorly. And so because the ulna is really locked in place in the humerus olecranon fossa, the ulna really doesn't move. The ulna may angle a little bit relative to how it was in supination, but it really doesn't change positions at all. In contrast, notice the radius. If we look at the proximal part of the radius, that really didn't change positions. But the distal part of the radius, notice that it's now completely positioned flopped on top of the ulna. Notice in supination, these two bones are parallel with one another. But when we pronate the hand, notice that this bottom part or distal part of the radius near the styloid process actually flips over the ulna. And that's what we see in pronation. So in supination, which is an anatomical position, the two bones are parallel to one another. But in pronation, the radius at the distal part of the bone, where the styloid process is right here, actually flips over the ulna. Okay. And now what we're going to do is put your hands back in this pronated position, so your palms are facing down, and then we're going to re-supinate, so reposition our hands so that it's face up. That is supination. And when you supinate, you basically go the opposite direction. So again, the ulna is not going to move. Not really. It will change its angle a little bit. But then we remove that radius distally from flopping on top of the ulna, and it rotates back to its original position, as you see right here. Okay? So that's the main difference between pronation and supination. Now, one thing that I did here in this video so far is I mentioned that the hand was pronated or the hand was supinated. If we want to be rigorously correct, we need to understand the joints that are actually involved in pronation and supination. It's really easy to consider the hand because we can see the hand. You can see that with your own naked eyes. But really to understand pronation and supination, we need to take a look at these bones here. 
Okay, this bone over here, which has the olecranon process at the top, this is the ulna. So ulna is on the right, and the radius is over here on the left. And just remember also, the radius is the lateral bone in the forearm. Ulna is the medial bone. Now, can you take a guess as this pronation or supination right here on the left? Well, considering the ulna and radius are parallel, this would be supination. This would be what we would see in anatomical position. And yes, between the ulna and radius, we have this dense connective tissue called the interosseous membrane. And then we have two joints. Okay, We have a proximal or superior, proximal is a better word, radio-ulnar joint up here. And then we have an inferior, or distal is a better word, distal radial ulnar joint. The distal radial ulnar joint is near the point where these bones articulate the carpal bones of the hand. And then the proximal radial ulnar joint up here is near to the elbow joint. It's called a radial ulnar joint because it's a joint, or articulation, between the radius and the ulna. And there's really two of them, a superior or proximal radial ulnar joint and an inferior or distal radial ulnar joint. Now, when you go between supination right here to a pronated position, which is here on the right, again, I know it's pronated because the distal part of the radius has flopped over a more or less stationary ulna. But if we look at the proximal radial ulnar joint, did this one really change positions a whole lot? Well, from supination on the left to pronation, no. The proximal radial ulnar joint really doesn't change much. But as we go distally down the forearm, we get more and more of a change. Until we see at the distal radial ulnar joint, this is where we have the most mobility. So if we look here distally, the radius has completely flipped over that stationary ulna. Um, and that's really due to that mobility at the distal radial ulnar joint. So there's really not a whole lot of mobility up here because this area is kind of locked in with the elbow joint, particularly the olecranon process here in the olecranon fossa of the humerus. Down here we have a lot more mobility at the distal radial ulnar joint. In fact, you should be able to feel this on yourself. So if you start off, again, in a supinated position, if you palpate or feel your styloid processes, um, those are going to be the little points near your wrist, um, near the um, interface between your forearm and your hand. You should be able to feel those bones sticking out. Those are your styloid processes. To understand this, if you really quickly go between pronation and supination, pronation, supination, pronation, supination, what you should see is your elbow is really not moving at all. There's a little movement, but not a lot. But in contrast, your wrist is all over the place. Okay, so the distal radio ulnar joint gives us that mobility down here, and so during pronation, that radius is going to rotate over a stationary ulna. But we really don't get a whole lot of movement at the proximal radio ulnar joint up here. Okay, so now that we hopefully understand the difference between pronation and supination, uh, let's go and talk about the supinator muscle. In this picture right here, here's our supinator muscle. Here's another view of it. Um, this muscle in yellow right here. Okay. Its origin is on the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. So it does originate on the humerus, it spans the elbow joint, and then it's going to insert on the lateral posterior and anterior surfaces of the proximal third of the radius. So this muscle is going to insert on the radius, right, right here. Again, we can see it right here, its insertion. Um, it's going to be innervated by the deep branch of the radial nerve. There's two branches of the radial nerve, a superficial branch, and then the deep branch actually pierces through the supinator. There's a supinator tunnel it goes through, but it's innervated by this deep branch of the radial nerve. And of course, the action of the supinator muscle is going to be radial ulnar supination. Now notice, I didn't say wrist supination, I didn't say hand supination, because if we're being rigorously correct, I should say radial ulnar supination. Why is it radial ulnar? Because the true joint that's moving is the radial ulnar joint, particularly the distal radial ulnar joint. And yes, we do have some movement in the proximal radial ulnar joint, but the distal one's really where the majority of that mobility is in terms of turning the palm up or down. But it's the radial ulnar joint. It's not the wrist joint. Okay, You can't have wrist supination. You can't really have hand supination. It's radial ulnar supination. 
And this muscle is actually synergistic with the biceps brachii. Now, even though this muscle spans the elbow joint, it's not really the elbow flexion that's causing the synergism. Okay? This muscle really doesn't flex the elbow. Okay? Um, it's synergistic with the biceps brachii because the biceps brachii also participate in, in radio ulnar supination. So they actually assist with that as well. So it's synergistic with the biceps brachii. So hopefully that makes sense. Now there's a couple other muscles that we're going to see here um, in future videos, and those are the pronator teres and pronator quadratus. And so here's pronator teres. You can see that it actually uh, originates on the medial epicondyle, and then it also is going to insert on the radius, about halfway down the radius. And so you can imagine that when this muscle contracts, it's going to pull the insertion right here on the radius toward the origin. And if you just visualize that, you could probably imagine that's going to pull the radius over the ulna, like you see here. There's a second pronator muscle called pronator quadratus. This muscle has its origin over here on the distal part of the ulna, and then it's going to insert on the distal part of the radius. And again, the insertion is going to be pulled toward the origin, and so that helps pull this distal part of the radius over that stationary ulna. And so those are going to be your major two pronator muscles of the radial ulnar joint, pronator teres and then pronator quadratus. Pronator quadratus being the distal muscle that actually whose fibers run perpendicular to the radius and ulna, but we'll cover that much later. And then the major supinator muscle in the forearm is going to be the supinator muscle, and it's going to have input also from biceps brachii. All right, so hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of not only the supinator muscle, but also the differences between pronation and supination of the radio ulnar joint. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.